on here. I, I've been watching a lot of your videos, getting amped up, uh, taking a lot of the information you put out there and uh, taking that at home and doing some of my training. Open up my mind to different uh, scenarios that you bring up. Uh, one of the videos I really liked is how you talked about how uh, to draw your weapon and fire with your non-dominant hand. Can you talk to us a little bit about that for people who, uh, a scenario such as a woman who's getting out of her car, she's a concealed carry, uh, uh, you know, weapons holder, she's got her uh, weapon on the left side, she's left hand dominant, so she automatically goes to grab the groceries with her left hand. What can a person like that do to protect themselves if an attacker approaches them? Well, there's there's obviously a hundred thousand possible variables in any kind of self defense situation, so it's really hard to game it. But I try to teach people uh, techniques that it basically provides you the tool, and based on the problem, you choose a tool, you deal with the problem. Um, and you brought up a really good point. People being left handed or right handed, they tend to use that dominant hand to carry whatever it is they're carrying. Um, and especially these days, it's very often you see people completely empty handed. They either got a cell phone or, or, you know, a bag or, or groceries or take out or what have you. Um, the easiest solution in a situation like that is to make sure that if you're going to carry something, you don't carry an object in a way that's going to actually attach that object to yourself, especially men. Men are really big on trying to take all the groceries in one trip, uh, be it into this, be it out of the store or into the home. We try to carry everything at once because, you know. Uh, economy and movement, but that does complicate accessing your firearm in a self-defense situation. Um, when I use, uh, I do use that particular scenario a lot in some of my classes where I'll actually have grocery bags on the range full of whatever I can throw in there that adds some significant realistic weight to it, and then let people kind of feel the delay they're going to experience in accessing their weapon if they carry things wrong. Yeah, so I'm going to stand up real quick. I'm going to show everybody one of the tricks that I saw from one of your videos, if you guys want to go in. So I'm left-hand dominant, and this is something I learned from watching one of his videos. So as you can see, I have my gun holstered here on the left side. And uh, what he was talking about is, say, you're holding a, a bag right here. you got your right hand free. You go in over here, pull the gun up, rotate it over your stomach, and then push it into fire. And that's something I learned from watching one of his videos, something I would have never thought about because... A lot of times you don't think about those different scenarios that could possibly pop up. So that's a great tool, I think, just to learn how to use your weapon with your non-dominant hand. And when you go to a firing range, don't just shoot with your dominant hand. Switch it over, go to your non-dominant hand, learn how to draw with both. That way you can be prepared as well. Definitely. So I've got an article right here I want to talk about, and it'll segue over into one of the main topics I would like to discuss with you. Uh, okay. It's a new article out. It says Pentagon says no guns for recruiters hide behind partitions instead. The Pentagon has decided against arming recruiters in the wake of the Chattanooga terror attack that killed five soldiers. Instead of guns, officers will get desk, desk partitions. So this is a soft target. We have uh, recruiters who won't be armed. They're a soft target, and that can be something that turns into an active shooter scenario. And I've watched some of your videos on active shooter scenarios and uh, found it very interesting how you talked about where to be in a hallway if there's a, a gunman coming at you, he's shooting, and then there's going to be people running at you. Can you kind of go over how to what, to, what to kind of think about, what to look for, what are the possibilities of what's going to happen when someone starts shooting? Uh, the well, way the, the unique nature of an active shooter situation, and it's something that other instructors kind of key into as well, is you've got generally you have two categories of criminal activity. You have a profit crime, which means there's actually they're coming there to gain ownership of something, it would be it money or whatever. Then you have a personal crime where someone actually has a grudge against someone. It's a crime of passion, so to speak. And then you have random acts of violence, which are I would consider what an active shooter would fall under. They're literally just going there to kill people. Now, they may have an ideology that's backing them up. They may have a, uh, a religious or a political motivation, um, but those things are actually kind of irrelevant because they don't actually help you in an academic or an active sense prevent the shooting. So it's, it's nice information because people love motive, but motive in most cases doesn't actually help you prevent the next situation from happening. Uh, there is no way to prevent an active shooting without the use of firearms. There just isn't. There's no social change that you can enact that's going to stop certain people from just having that mental snap and deciding they want to shoot people in this category or this category. So the best way to be prepared is to be armed and 
because the Second Amendment recognizes our natural right of self-defense, you have a moral and ethical responsibility to be as well-trained as you can be uh, to operate that firearm, be it, it protecting yourself and protecting those that you choose to protect. The military, DOD, um, it's either Department of Navy or Department of Army driven because they're both very conservative. What they're doing, and I kind of read between the lines when they put out policies like that, is what they're basically admitting to is they're not willing to invest the time to train their people correctly. Um, it's a lot different training an 18-year-old to go over and fight in Iraq than it is training a seasoned NCO recruiter on how to work a handgun in a close quarter situation. So what they're basically saying is we don't have the money or the time to train these guys to use handguns. So we're just going to go ahead and hope for the best. So I was watching one of your videos and I thought it was really interesting. You were talking about a, a scenario where there's an armed shooter. You're in a school, we'll say, and you're standing mm -hmm. in the hall in the hallway and yeah. uh, you've got your gun on you. What's mm -hmm. happening? Someone starts shooting. What's going to happen? All those people are going to start running away from the shooter, right? And you uh, said ideally, yeah, they're going to either run away from the shooter or if the shooter is blocking the only exit to the room, it's it's highly possible that they'll try to run kind of part around him to get to that exit. Uh, but generally, in a hallway situation, everyone is going to go away from the sounds of gunfire or away from the sights of violence. So, OK, so you are the person in the hallway and you have your concealed uh, carry. OK, what are you going to do? You've got people well, running towards you. You're not going to stand in the middle of the hallway, right? No, I'm going to move to I'm going to move to the one of the two walls, uh, and the reason for that being is if you're standing in the middle, you can have people pass by your left side and your right side, which is obviously going to affect your ability to travel down that hallway because you're going against the flow of traffic, and it's going to compromise your control of your weapon system. So for me, I would move to one of the other walls to allow people to pass by me just on one side, preferably on my support side, so my weapon is between me and the wall. Uh, but again. The situation may not allow you to set yourself up in the most ideal situation, but one of those two walls is going to allow you to move against the flow of traffic a lot more effectively. Yeah, exactly. So I'm going to stand up again real quick, and this is one of the things I was seeing. So you've got your gun, you're going for it, and you're standing in the middle of the hallway like this, and you've got your, you know, your position, you're getting ready to start firing. People start running at you. So what he's saying is you've got your dominant hand, your firing arm. You're going to go over here and lean to a wall and put your shoulder up against that wall. Now, what that's going to do is prevent people from running in between you and the wall. So you've created this area where people have to run and come around you, and you're not standing in the middle of that hallway where people are running at you, and you're trying to get that shooter and take him out so there's no longer a threat. So you're going to put yourself and move down that hallway with your shoulder against the wall so people will go around you, and it'll prevent civilians from getting hurt. Also, keep them from knocking you over and giving you a better chance to take out the threat. Is that correct? Yeah, and, and another huge thing is if you choose to get involved, because it is a choice, it's obviously for some of us, it's going to be a moral or ethical proportion to get involved because, you know, especially real pro 2A people, the ones that take training and practice really seriously and they have a really good head on their shoulders, they tend to be those kind of people that help. And you're going to have just that natural subconscious convulsion to want to help. But what's more important than being able to run the gun effectively is let people know that you're actually there to help. One thing that I see that does not get practiced nearly enough in any class, not just active shooter related, but any class whatsoever is verbal commands, being able to verbalize your intent, let people know that you're actually there to help. Because if you just draw a gun and all they see is a firearm, now they feel like there's a shooter in front of them and a shooter behind them. And that can completely complicate the situation and it might endanger your safety as well. Yeah, exactly. Because those people are going to see you. They might run yeah. into the actual person that's trying to actually do harm. That's definitely so me, a great point. I, I, I try to keep it simple. I just, you know, repeat as loud as you can. Use your outdoor voice. Where is he? I'm here to help. I'm here to help. Where is he? Um, try to get any kind of information you can. Uh, it's going to happen pretty quick, pretty fast. Uh, most active shooter situations are over in the single digits when it comes to minutes. Um, but they're predominantly stopped by citizens. They're not stopped very often by law enforcement because usually the shooter has either run out of ammunition run out of motivation or self-terminated by the time law enforcement arrives. So what got you interested in doing this kind of training? I, you know, I read in your profile, I, I actually had a chance to meet you uh, about a month or so ago at a head down event in uh, Georgia and uh, got to talk a little bit and told me about your website and all that. You used to be in the army. You were 31 Delta. Tell everyone what that was. No, I was, I was an 11 Bravo. You were what? 
I was an 11 Bravo. Oh, you were? Okay. I thought it said 31 yeah. Delta on your profile. My bad. No, that might be one of my other instructors. Oh, okay, um, okay. So yeah, you're an 11 I, uh, Bravo. That was infantry. So you've yeah. taken that. You've you've converted from combat overseas to purpose-driven training here in the civilian sector. To well, I, I, I kind of dabbled in every field. I, I started, I went into the military at 17, uh, and I was infantry. And then I left the military and went into private security contracting. And then I left private security contracting and went into law enforcement. Uh, so I've I've seen all three sides of your traditional gun driven professions, uh, but what I guess what I experienced was that like the people outside of the military and outside of law enforcement to a certain degree, the people who are facing the situations where training is the the, the biggest lacking, I would say that of the worst quality is is just the, the citizen, the actual everyday American. They do not get the training, and, and obviously. You know, it's not like it's occupationally required. You know, you don't sign up to be an American and have to take a gun class. Like, so it's it's up to. All the right, well, we're going to go to break really quick, Aaron. We'll be back. Yeah. Don't forget, we've extended the money bomb uh, shipping until midnight tonight. So you got nine hours and forty minutes. We also have a whole lot of sales going on that'll continue on until Sunday. We'll talk more about that later. Thank you for listening to the Infowars Overdrive. Welcome to the InfoWars Overdrive. I'm your host, Joe Biggs, and my guest today is Aaron Cohen of Sage Dynamics Purpose Driven Training. Now, before we get back to him, I want to talk about a few of our specials. The Money Bomb has been extended on till Sunday. Uh, the free shipping will last for the next nine hours and 35 minutes up until midnight. Uh, the Money Bomb so far has been an outstanding su success Due to you, the listeners of InfoWars.com, The Alex Jones Show, you guys have been fantastic. An overflow of support from all of you has just been amazing. I can't say too much about it. Uh, both Survival Shield X2 Nascent Iodine and DNA Force are 25% off at the InfoWarsLife.com store. So make sure you go check out those specials there today. So Aaron, let's get back to you. There's a different part of the active shooter scenario that's going to happen that you have to get used to. Now, you talked about when you draw your weapon is to clearly say in a loud voice that I'm here to help. Where's the shooter? Now you have another part that's going to be injected into the situation. You're going to have law enforcement show up. So how do you as a concealed carrier, you're in there trying to help. Now, how do you interact with law enforcement once they've been brought into the situation? Well, it, 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 the stars would have to perfectly align uh, for you to engage the shooter at the same time law enforcement is showing up and engaging the shooter. The timelines just aren't going to be the same. Law enforcement, I mean, physics is what it is. It's going to take law enforcement time to respond. And shooters tend to choose soft targets that do not have law enforcement response in the immediate area. Uh, they may not think so much about where this closest police station, but they are going to think about, okay, is there going to be cops at this place? And if the answer is no, that's probably going to be a viable target. The thing that people have to remember is when law enforcement does get on scene, you need to obey every single command they give you without hesitation because they do not know who you are. They do not know that you are the guy who helped. They won't know that until later. Um, often, depending on how far away the officer is, or I should say how close the officer is to when he's dispatched, he may not even know the nature of the call by the time he arrives because it takes time for the dispatchers to get that information to the responding units. It may be a disturbance call. It may just be a shots fired call. They may not actually know what they're dealing with when they show up. So they're going to see a plainclothes individual, somebody in just everyday clothing with a firearm. Um, so obviously you have to, and I can't stress that enough, obey all commands. Even they're going to, they're, they're going to have you put your gun down. If you haven't already done that, they're going to prone you out. They're probably going to handcuff. Uh, in fact, I would, I'd almost guarantee that. That doesn't mean you're going to be arrested and go to prison. But it's going to help protect yourself and the officers themselves, as well as anyone else who's in the situation, who's involved in the situation. So I can't stress that enough. Obey all verbal commands. Um, it's going to be okay. It's just going to take time for them to actually sort out exactly what happened and what your involvement in it was. So right now, personally, what is your go-to, uh, say, sidearm that you like to carry? I carry an Agency Arms Glock 19 or a Glock 17 their field edition. It is a customized Glock handgun. Yeah, I just picked up uh, this Zev, uh, Zev Custom right here. It's a Glock okay. 19 Gen 3. Yeah, yeah. I've got the, I carried uh, Zev some years ago. They make a good gun. Yeah, so I got this from Georgia Optics and also have the Viridian X5L uh, light and laser combo on the bottom as well, so I like it. I've been shooting it a lot. I just put the uh, brand new uh, Fulcrum trigger on it today, actually, and uh, I'm going to go out and shoot that later on this afternoon. Um, 
So another thing I want to talk about uh, as well before we go to break here in the next couple minutes is tell us about.